So our second speaker today is Jules Lemaire. He is going to talk about Heisenberg spin chains and long range versions of it. All right, I'll give the, the last few arrivals time to uh, find a seat. Um, so first, I'd like to thank the organizers and especially Filippo uh, for this uh, beautiful workshop. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very happy that the weather is also uh, cooperating. And indeed, today I'll talk about the Heisenberg spin chain, which uh, I suppose is known to everyone, and its long range friends. So I like long range uh, quantum integrable spin chains. And I want to argue that Heisenberg spin chain naturally sits in the long range world really, and it's kind of a special nearest neighbor point, but it's kind of quite interesting to view it in the context of long range spin chains. And this is based on uh, work with um, Rob Klaberst, uh, who is a long time collaborator. He's in uh, Berlin now, and with Vincent Pasquier and Stidina, who are both here. Um, and right, so the, um, sort of the, the big landscape that I like to show is this one here. So this is kind of a landscape of uh, long range spin chains. So on the left column, we find the Heisenberg spin chains, which we know pretty well. It comes in three levels. There's the basic, the isotropic version, the Heisenberg XXX model. Then there's a partially isotropic version, which is the XXZ. Oh, and then there is the totally anisotropic model, which is the XYZ. So the further you go down, the more spin symmetry there is. Now there's another axis here, which is the long range axis. So here we're in the nearest neighbor kind of area, but we can turn on long range interactions, at least in the isotropic level. And then you can go via from Heisenberg via what's called the Inozemtsev spin chain, which I will introduce to another fairly well-known spin chain that is the Haldane-Shastri model. And this also comes with an XXZ-like version, the Q-deformed Haldane-Shastri model. And there are notice notably some empty point ports uh, in this map. So really one of my long-term goals is to try to understand what is happening um, in this blank area of the map. But today I would like to tell you about kind of two ways that the Heisenberg models are related to long range spin chains. So the first one is this isotropic level. So that will be the start. And then later I'll actually talk about a slightly different version which will be related to the Q-deformed Haldane-Shastri. Um, but it's another deformation which is not quite on this map of Heisenberg XXZ. Um, let's see, all right. So here is a typical anatomy of a spin chain. So for simplicity, let's take L sites with spin one half only. So Hamiltonians typically have this type of form. So it's for long range spin chains, it's a uh, sum over pairs of sites, I and J like here on the spin chain. And um, each site has this long range uh, spin exchange interaction, one minus the permutation. So it's an anti-symmetrization spin exchange interaction. And then spins that are further apart might interact less strongly. So there's a potential function here, which dampens the interactions at longer range. And the, the potential function determines the long range behavior. Um, let me note that this spin chain, these type of spin chains, they're isotropic. So they commute with SL2 or SU2, if you wish, because of this structure of the spin interactions. And then they're also homogeneous because this potential here depends on the distance between I and J along the circle. So here, I mean the distance on the, um, well, Z modulo LZ, if you wish, the, the circle with circumference L. So it, since it only depends on the distance between these two sites, this potential uh, becomes translationally invariant. And so there is a transaction of translations which commute with these type of Hamiltonians. So some important examples, which I mentioned just before, are the Heisenberg spin chain, for which this potential just forces the two spins to be adjacent. So there's a Kronecker delta, this potential function, and you get a nearest neighbor interaction. So everybody uh, knows and loves this spin chain. On the other side, there's another kind of rather nice point, which is in, in which the potential is basically one over the court distance squared, which is this dot. Uh, so one over the square of this dash length here of the distance, the core distance between the two spin uh, sides. Or if you want normal coordinates, then it is uh, basically one over sine squared of this distance along the circle rather than through the middle. Okay, this is a Haldane-Shastri spin chain. It was found in the late 80s and it has a lot of very beautiful properties that I'll outline later. So although this Hamiltonian looks a little bit more simple, it uh, a little bit more complicated than that of Heisenberg, it turns out that actually the, the physics, the behavior and the mathematics, the representation theory of this model is very, very beautiful. And this model is actually simpler in some sense than the Heisenberg spin chain. Now there is a more 
or less well-known uh, intermediate spin chain here, which is called the Inozemtsev spin chain. So this was found by Inozemtsev, and it is rather more subtle than either of its limits, but it is an interpolation between the two. So the potential in this case is a wire truss P function. So it's an elliptic function. It has two periods. The one is the length of the chain to make sure that we're L periodic, like the one over sine squared is L periodic. And the other one is a purely imaginary period, which is traditionally parameterized by I pi over kappa. And I take kappa to be a positive real number. And this kappa sets the interaction distance. So if I send kappa to infinity, then this, if I put the right constants here, precisely becomes on the lattice, becomes this nearest neighbor pair potential. So basically this Weierstrass p function spikes very sharply and we only have interactions between nearest neighbors. Then if um, kappa um, becomes lower, 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 we get this general Weierstrass p function. And then if kappa goes all the way to zero, we remove this imaginary period. We send it to I infinity and we get this one over sine squared here. Uh, if you would want, so the way to think about this wire stress P function is it, it contains this one over sine squared. And actually, if you would send L to infinity instead, so you remove the real period, then you get one over sinh squared, which indeed has a periodic, uh, sorry, an imaginary period. So you kind of think of this wire stress P function, if you've never seen it before, as kind of a combination of one over sine squared and one over sinh squared, two periods. Bernard? It's convenient and it's I don't know if it's essential, but I uh, it, it is certainly the standard way to do it and I have yeah, never really thought about what why but I think I think this contains really everything that we want in terms of this picture here. So of course you could play with this and actually there are lots of things that you can vary in this picture. But here I want to focus on the basic kind of case. Um, probably that's there, there might be re relations for hermeticity and so on that might be quite true, but I am not sure uh, I have to think a bit about that. All right, so these type of spin chains, they have this isotropy so SL2 invariance and homogeneity so some action of the uh, integers by translation per periodic cyclic translations, so it means that the Hilbert space has this kind of nice structure, we can just use the representation theory to understand uh, part of the structure of the Hilbert space, so here I've drawn basis vectors for the Hilbert space. So each dot represents a one-dimensional subspace, and I want to use the symmetries to kind of put, to kind of group them in a nice way. So firstly, I want to use this SL2 symmetry. So SL2 has a spin raising, a spin lowering, and a spin Z component. Spin Z here just measures, so this uh, vertical axis is the, the spin Z value. So here I denote by M the number of down spins, or if you want the weights, I gave the weights here. So it's a weight space decomposition, these different levels here. And then the raising and the lowering operators allow us to go up and down between these vertical strings of one dimensional vectors, right? So each of these kind of vertical strings here is uh, irreducible for SL2. Um, and so by SL2 symmetry, it suffices to find these red dots here, which are the highest weight vectors. Of course, if you have zero down spins, then we know which vector it is. It's just a vector with all spins up. And so we understand immediately this entire uh, L plus one dimensional irreducible. So this is what SL2 uh, gives us. We need to find what these red dots here are. So now we can use an extra symmetry, which is that actually we had this translational invariance. So this actually fixes these red dots here. They're called magnons. This is their explicit form. The wave function is just a plain wave here with some value P here. It's such that the cyclic translation X by E to the I P, P is called the momentum and it has to be quantized because we're on a circle. And then since these are uh, L eigen or L minus one, if you forbid P is zero eigenvectors, you get all of these vectors here. So they must be eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian as well. You can act with the Hamiltonian on these vectors and you find their energy. And if you think of this energy as a function of this momentum, then that function is called the dispersion relation. Sorry? Um, in these cases, yes. And I'll show you in a moment what they are. Um, so because of these two symmetries, really the job is to understand these red dots here. 
So I want to say a little bit more about this. So usually we use some sort of beta ansatz, and indeed this can be done here. So that will be the next point, but let's first show what the, so this is just a dispersion. So here I plotted the energy up and the momentum from zero to two pi horizontally. So here's the momentum, here's the momentum, and here's the momentum. This is the Heisenberg point. Here is, you know, Zemtsev for maybe kappa is one or something. And then here is Haldane Shastri uh, where I removed the imaginary period. And so here you find this dispersion is just the sine squared that you know from the beta ansatz. Here it is some more complicated elliptic function. And then here it becomes very nicely for Haldane Shastri a parabola. So it's a half, p times two pi minus p. So it's just a very beautiful parabola that's zero and zero and in two pi. So this is a very nice dispersion of Haldane Shastri. This is one of the first signs that something special is going on here. Um, and this was the eigenvalues for the MS1 sector. So let's go back to this picture. Um, this is the, eigenvec the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian on these dots here. But in fact, by SL2 symmetry, it's also the eigenvalues of these dots here, right? We know by SL2 symmetry, we actually know what all of these dots here are because we just applied the lowering operator. So um, here, I really want to focus on this two particle sector. This is the first time that it starts to become a bit more interesting. Uh, luckily, it's, it's much simpler than more than two particles. So for now, I want to really focus on the two particle sector and show you that actually this is a very nice structure. So we understand for the, so what we have to do is we have to solve these beta equations. I don't really want to go into details, but the point is that we have some uh, equation for what are called the quasi momenta. We think of them as the momenta of the separate down spins. And they're such that the sum of these two P1 and P2 is the total momentum that I had before. And these quasi momenta, I kind of, I would like them to be two pi over L times an integer. That would be what happened for the magnons in a free theory, but this is an interacting model. So there will be some correction because of the interactions. And there's some known scattering phase function, which gives us this modification of the value of these quasi momenta because of the interactions. And then these integers. So what I need to do is I need to, so this theta is a known function. I don't want to give it here, but, um, I want to give for each value of integers or for each suitable pair of values of these integers, I need to solve this beta ansatz equations. And so if I take my first integer, be, so I can order them without loss of generality. And if I take my first integer to be zero, then I can show that it's, there's a solution for which the first quasi momentum is zero. The second quasi momentum is kind of the total momentum. And it is just two pi over the length times an integer, because in this case, there's no interaction. So these are these descendants that I mentioned before. Um, and maybe I should mention, sorry, that these we, we know, of course, explicitly what these um, uh, what this what this elliptic function here is. Now, the next case is we have to look at these red dots, right? The highest weight vectors, and they come in two types. So first, I want to focus on the simple type, and you can call them scattering states. So if these two integers are not equal and not neighboring, but sort of sufficiently far apart, then you can check that there are l minus two choose two of such pairs in in this range, and for each of these pairs of integers, non-zero, um, there exists a unique real value of this scattering function. So if you num numerically solve the beta ansatz equations, you get a unique value here for Heisenberg, which is quite small. So it means that these quasi momenta are actually quite slightly pulled towards each other. So they kind of attract each other a little bit, but they're not very far from these two pi over the length times integer values. So the interactions are quite weak in this case. And if you look at the wave function, you can interpret this as a scattering state in the sense that the magnons are typically kind of going around the circle and they don't, they kind of, they feel each other a little bit, but they kind of scatter along each other. And um, of course, this is fine at length, so it's not proper scattering states, but it's kind of a good way to think of them. And if you look at the energy, since the quasi moment are so close to their free values, the energy is very close to the sum of those two free energies. And here, I've plotted both the values, the actual values of the energies and the sum of these two free values. So you see that the energies are actually slightly higher, but only slightly so. This is for length 26 or so. Um, so these are all the possible uh, scattering states for Heisenberg. Now, if you turn on Inozemsep, it turns out that this scattering, this, this phase here is going to decrease a little bit. So actually the values, the, the quasi momenta are going to get closer to their free values, the interactions, the, 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 so as we turn on the long range interactions, um, the quasi momenta become closer to being free. So the energy also becomes closer to just this being the sum of the two free energies. And I mean, the, to the two values of the energy uh, for the free quasi momenta. And you see that these dots are closer to the open circles than they were here, if you look very carefully. 
Another thing that you see maybe is that here the dispersion went right through this sort of envelope of the scattering states here. I don't know, it starts to unfold a bit, so stuff is going to happen. Now, quite interestingly, if we send kappa all the way to zero, so we really get this long range model where we had one over the sine squared, then it turns out that the first, that these quasi momenta, they become precisely two points over the length times an integer. So this model is in some sense free. These two magnons, they don't really feel each other except for the rule that they cannot be equal or adjacent here. Remember, this is the, the case of integers that we're looking at. And the energy as a consequence is literally the sum of the two separate energies. So this is really nice. So you see that here the circles and the dots really completely overlap. This is an extremely regular, a nice spectrum. And you can check that, for instance, if you choose here the second quasi-momentum and here, I don't know, the 10th, then at the 12th quasi-momentum, there will be a dot, which is precisely the geometric sum of these two vectors. It's really the sum. Um, so th this is a very nice property of haldane shastri And the scattering phase, let me emphasize again, is zero for haldane shastri Now the last, so if you really do the counting, you notice that we don't quite have everybody yet. So there's few uh, solutions that we still need to find. And they're more subtle. Um, my computer is taking a while. There they are. Um, so now what we do is we need to take the, the first integer again positive, and the second integer should be either equal to the first or the first plus one. So they should be either coinciding or just next to each other. And then we have to take suitable values of these so that we get the remaining L minus three. We can kind of classify very nicely how to do this. And then it's more interesting. So what happens if the length is low enough? I don't want to go into... Uh, uh, larger length unbinding kind of issues. Um, there is a unique value of the scattering phase for Heisenberg so that the, the two quasi momenta are each other's complex conjugates. So the real part is just so that they maybe become the average. They really sit at the average of these two uh, free values. And then there's some positive real part for P1, let's say, and then this is the complex conjugate of P1. And it turns out that the energy of this is roughly half the energy of if you would take the total momentum. So in fact, here you get basically half times the dispersion relation and it's not quite true for if the length would go to infinity, then really the bound state curve becomes half the dispersion, but it's extremely good approximation even for finite length. Um, so the interpretation here is that they are bound states because if you look at the wave function and typically the two down spins tend to be very, very close to each other. There's a strange uh, exceptional case in which they're actually kind of ant antipodal. Um, so they're a bit like a Lagrange pair where one is kind of moving precisely on the opposite side of the other, but that's again a detail. So let's call these bound states. Now, if you turn on long range interactions, then because of the, we have an elliptic function now. So we don't, so this was two pi periodic, which is related to the L periodicity of the chain. But now the uh, Weierstrass P function also had an imaginary period. And it means that these quasi momentum momenta also get a imaginary period. So in fact, what I can do is I can either go from minus i kappa to plus i kappa, so this fundamental parallel domain, or I instead I can take the opposite, the, the positive half plane. I can take this thing. So let's instead of p2 being here, think of p2 as being there by 2i kappa uh, periodicity. So now what's going to happen, and we uh, looked at this quite carefully numerically and so on uh, for MS2, is that these s uh, the interaction range increases. These two quasi momenta, they get closer and closer to each other. At some kind of crypt critical value of kappa, they're going to bounce. This is not physically significant, but it's, you can actually, we can write down an equation that determines this value. And then what happens is that one of the quasi momenta moves to the left and the other to the right. This is what Didina mentioned the other week. There are two types of bound states. One are complex conjugates, and then there's another type. They correspond to the case where one P is here and one P is here. So they're kind of different, but you can check that the energy is still real. So this is really because of the elliptic properties of the uh, energy function. And what you can check is that in this case, the energy is going to increase. So what's going to happen is that here we had half the dispersion, but now actually this curve is going to move up as we increase the interaction distance. And if we go all the way to Haldane Shastri, something again really remarkable happens. So if we follow around what happens with these two solutions, remember that I'm decreasing kappa. So at really this half period here, the imaginary half period is also going to go to zero. And in the Haldane Shastri limit, it's strictly zero. So we know that the quasi momentum must end up on the real axis. And what turns out is that the quasi momentum that went left Ends up, ends up precisely on the origin, and the one that moved right ends up precisely at the total momentum. 
So this is quite interesting because it means, firstly, that the energy is precisely the energy of just the second quasi-momentum. So what we have here, this situation is really very similar or the same as this situation up here. Here we knew that it was because of SL2 symmetry, and now the spectrum shows us that there should be extra symmetries. So in terms of this picture here, the bound state curve have, has really, in the limit of Halden Shellstream model, has merged onto this parabola here. So there must be some extra symmetry. And Haldane did these type of studies numerically for much smaller system size, but he kind of realized that this must be true. And then in Saclay, um, it was realized that actually there is a big extra symmetry algebra for the Haldane Shastri model, namely the Youngian. I don't really want to go into the details, but here I gave the Dreamfeld first presentation. So the point is that besides just spin lowering and spin raising operators and spin Z, we now also have some sort of affine lowering and raising operators and some affine. I don't know, spin Z, let's say. And we can write down explicit expressions. They're kind of bilocal, so they're a bit more complicated. Um, but because of these extra lowering operators, the spectrum again reorganizes and we get bigger irreducible components. So what happens in the Haldane Shastri uh, limit is that, remember, these vertical strings were just SL2 irreducibles. But now, because we have extra lowering operators, some SL2 irreducibles are going to merge into one big Youngian irreducible, and that's what you see here. So in fact, this SL2 highest weight vector is a Youngian highest weight vector. It's annihilated by Q plus and by S plus. But if you take act with by Q minus or something, uh, kind of a suitable linear combination of Q, uh, Q minus and S minus, then instead you're going to get this thing, which was the limit of the, the um, well, the bound states for, for, uh, for Heisenberg and then Inozemtsev. So the point is that we have lots of these extra symmetries, and because of these extra symmetries, we only need to know the Youngian highest weight vectors. And they are labeled by these patterns called motifs, and motifs are just, uh, let's say, an increasing sequence of integers between uh, one and the length minus one. So I don't allow zero modulo L, so that the integers are not equal and not uh, neighboring. Remember, this was the condition that we had for scattering states. Sorry. Yes? Yes? They have the same momentum and the same energy, that's right. The momentum, oh sorry, the, this motif, what I call the motif, it labels everything. So the motif actually here, so here the motif is just the value of the second integer. Here the motif is the two integers, which indeed are not equal and not adjacent. And here the motif is just the, the non-zero integer. So this motif is the same as this motif, in fact. And these motifs, they are just those. So now we know that these are just these integers. So you get the momentum by multiplying two pi over the length times the sum of all these integers, modulo L. No, but ah. right. Sorry, okay, so yes, it is true. So Q, QZ is distinguishes between this guy and this or these two, for instance. So yeah, that's right. Sorry, okay. So it, yeah, the Youngian gives us these extra distinguishing operators. All right, so kind of to summarize and to really drive home the point, I hope. So for here, I get, have plotted the energy, now not as a function of momentum, but as a function of this deformation parameter. So here we have the nearest neighbor Heisenberg model. Then we turn on long range interactions until we get all the way to Halle and Shastri. And what we did here just for length six, because then we can, the plot is not too complicated, not too messy. So here I've labeled all the points by their scattering and bound states and so on. So the integers for Heisenberg. And in blue, the scattering states, note that they are never equal or adjacent. And then here, some choice for the integers for bound states. And so what you see is that as you go to the left, well, the energies go up typically. And then at some point, there are crossing energy levels. This is quite important. It signals that the model should be integrable. There should be hidden conserved quantities that kind of mean that everything is preserved, even if the two uh, energy levels get very close and become equal. And in the end, what can happen is that several energy levels coming from Heisenberg via Inozemtsev for Haldane-Shastri merge. 
So this is again the point that I made before. So at such a merge, what happens is that the top line is this Youngian highest weight vector, and the lower two are when you get these, well, as you can check here, they're always bound states. For, so for instance, one, four, and 2,5 go here. And below this, there is 155 and 115. So they're bound states. So the bound states kind of always come from below, as we saw in the in the previous plot. The, the bound state curve moves up until it hits the dispersion at Haldane Shastri. And so we get this very nice correspondence, which we, we really checked very carefully for MS2. And at least at the level of the counting, it works for general M. So I'm quite convinced that it will work. We're currently checking this for MS3, but it's much more complicated. So the point is that for Heisenberg, we have scattering states labeled by these integers that are not equal and not adjacent. And as you go through in a they will flow to Youngian's, Youngian highest weight vectors. Instead, bound states here for which two of the integers are equal or adjacent will flow to what we call affine descendants or where we used at least a part of Q minus to get this vector. So this is actually, I think, a very nice uh, principle. So one thing that I think it helps uh, doing, and there's another thing that I'm looking at, is here we have Youngian representation theory, which is quite rigid. And we know the Dreamfeld polynomial. So we really know everything about the representation theory here. So what we should be able to do is we should be able to use this representation theory here to organize the spectrum of the Heisenberg uh, uh, spin chain, where I want to think of the bound states as some sort of descendants. Of course, for Heisenberg, they're not descendants, but they're those vectors which in the Haldane Shastri limits become affine descendants. And I think this is a very nice organizing principle. And I hope that it's, I mean, it will not address um, completeness, of course, because I'm not going to prove that everything works well. But I think it gives a very good heuristic of uh, writing down a way to organize. Well, at least I hope that it gives a good heuristic for organizing the Heisenberg um, spin chain, where for each scattering state, you can kind of from Youngian representation theory, compute precisely which bound states should correspond to it in the limit. So I think this is one point of view where you see that the long range perspective really might actually be quite useful, even just for the nearest neighbor Heisenberg spin chain. So continue. So talking about finite length here, I'm a kind of a finite. Sorry. So, so both. So actually, all of these chains are known to go to a West amino, so level one West amino Witten model. In the uh, the low energy limit is described by this with the same uh, charge. Um, so, um, moreover, it is also known that the Heisenberg spin chain has an asymptotic Youngian. Uh, symmetry. So if you send the length to infinity, there's actually an action of the Youngian. And here there is sort of another action of the Youngian. And this is work of the Nina and Vincent long ago. It's related in the QD form setting to this uh, level zero structure of level one modules and so on. So there's a very nice representation theoretic story. I don't really understand the details yet. Um, so I think there will be some more. I, I believe that in fact, in this case, there should be some well, two actions of a Youngian, and I think this, so there should be some sort of affine Youngian, so sort of, uh, let's say Q is one version of a quantum toroidal algebra acting uh, there. So that's something that I kind of hope to be true, but I am uh, not far enough yet to understand this. But right, I think there's definitely interesting things to be done there. All right, so we've seen that Haldane Shastri spin chain is very special. We actually the, the solution of the beta equations was just formed by the, these motifs. So it was very simple. Actually, solving the beta equations is easier than writing down something that formally looks like a beta equations that has those uh, motifs as solutions. Um, but that can be done. But let me tell you briefly about the algebraic background for this, uh, the, the really the reason why Haldane Shastri was so nice. And this is as follows. So there's a very nice algebraic picture, which is this one here. So this is like a cartoon of what happens. So Haldane Shastri sits here in the right corner. But what we need to do in terms of representation theories, we need to start from some thing, which is the symmetric group with extra generators called Dunkel operators, or at least they're represented by Dunkel operators. And together they obey relations of the so-called degenerate affine Hecke algebra. Now, this algebra, I don't want to go into the details, but it has a representation on scalar bosons, which can be interpreted as being related to the trigonometric Calogero Sutherland model. So this action here by Dunkel operators, if you symmetrize essentially, which is related to these bosons, gives rise to some uh, bosonic model of, of particles moving on a circle while interacting in pairs. 
And this model is known to have commuting Hamiltonians, so a family of commuting Hamiltonians, and it has exact eigenfunctions given by Jack polynomials, essentially. So this is a very nice algebraic story. Now, what you can do is rather than just looking at particles that move on a circle, you can give these particles spin. So let's give them spin one half. Then we have such a picture of particles with spin moving on a circle. And again, so this is what I would call the trigonometric spin Calogero Sutherland model. Again, this model has computing Hamiltonians, which you can write down. Um, and moreover, it has Youngian symmetry. So this is something very special. Um, mathematically, this can be, so really this map is what's called the Trinfeld functor. Um, so you associate to a representation of the degenerate affine Hecke algebra, a representation of the Youngian. And now what we can do is basically we can take a certain limit which is called freezing, and Didina talked much more about it uh, last week, which is like a semi-classical uh, limit in which the particles move slower and slower and slower until they come at a halt at their classical equilibria positions, which are equally spaced. So you get, in terms of cartoons, you get such a spin chain. And this gives commuting Hamiltonians obtained by freezing from those here, as well as this Jungian action that I wrote down here. Again, coming from this more general model by freezing, if you do things carefully. And moreover, and this is kind of very cute, this haldane shastri spin chain, if you look at the M particle sector, so with M down spins, so those are the kind of pink arrows here, then there is a connection between these down spins, they behave just like a scalar Calogero Sutherland model with only M particles at special values of the couplings, and that's really where uh, the relation comes from that we can, actually we know the exact eigenvectors here as well. So in tiny bit more detail, I actually don't really want to go. So here's the trigonometric color Giro Sutherland Hamiltonians. Here's the spin version. There's just a, this one here is replaced by a permutation. The rest doesn't matter. Um, so maybe what I want to highlight is that the exact eigenvectors again evolve. So it looks a bit complicated, but it's just a van der Monde squared times a Jack polynomial. And this Jack polynomial is determined by the motif. So once you know the motif, you know these exact Young and highest weight vectors actually for any M. So it's a beautiful story and it really follows from this big algebraic picture here. Um, I think I don't really want to go into details, but if anybody's interested, I'm very happy to uh, talk more about it uh, afterwards. So here's the summary of what I told you in the isotropic level. So we had these three spin chains, Heisenberg, Inozemtsev, and haldane shastri um, Let me distinguish between three different notions. First is exact solvability. This, by this, I mean that we can find some of the spectrum. Um, and um, exact solvability, you know, so this is what, uh, so the, whole, the, the Heisenberg spin chain was exactly solvable once beta found the beta ansatz. So he was able to characterize the spectrum exactly up to solving the beta equations. Um, now there is a kind of a deeper, so this really kind of points towards the underlying structure, but I would not, so once we find this underlying structure, we know more. So this is what I want to call quantum integrable. And here I take some sort of microscopic definition. So Young-Baxter integrable, there's some quantum group underlying this model, also Youngian, as uh, Fadeyev and company realized. And via the algebraic beta ansatz, you can recover this exact solution of beta. And moreover, you can, via the transfer matrix, uh, find higher Hamiltonians, which is like a sort of a macroscopic version of integrability, the existence of lots of... Sorry, I don't know why the microphone is unhappy. Okay, um, right. So let's compare this to Halde Shastri. For Halde Shastri, instead, we use this connection to the Calogero Sutherland model, which I outlined before. And it gives a closed form description of the highest Youngian highest weight vectors. So this is simpler in the sense that we don't have to solve beta equations anymore. And we, we really have exact uh, description of the spectrum. This came, as I showed you before, from an underlying degenerate affine Hecke algebra and a related Youngian symmetry. And again, it also gives this family of higher Hamiltonians. For Inos Emtsev, it turns out that you need to use both a beta ansatz and then you get some connection to an elliptic calogero Sutherland model. So you really mix the methods here and here. And then again, you get an exact description of the spectrum up to solving beta ansatz equations. This was first done by Inos Emtsev and then we kind of find the kind of a better parameterization uh, in which we can really take the Heisenberg limit as I showed you in fact, not just for the, the, the beta roots, but we can also really get for the MS2, for the two down, uh, the, the two spins down sector, we can really show that if you look at the wave functions here, they really limit to the beta ansatz wave functions here, and they limit to this van der Monde squared times Jack polynomials here. So it's very nice. We really get a complete kind of match in the limits. 
And you know, Zemtsev also has a conjectured uh, family of higher Hamiltonians. There's a proof that the first two of them commute. Um, so this is less well known than the situation of these sort of macroscopic integrability for Heisenberg and Haldane Shastri. But I think that, well, things are happening here, and hopefully in a year or so, um, this is this is settled. One really interesting issue here is that for you know, Zemtsev, we don't know an underlying microscopic integrability. So we don't know sort of an L operator or a Youngian uh, action here, and this would be amazing. So I'm kind of trying, and at, a while ago I was hopeful that I would be able to solve it, but then I found that that didn't work after all. So, you know, this is a thing that I keep going back to. And No, I will go into that later. It doesn't. It's something, no, let me get back to this later. It's different. Oh, this is an exact computation. So what you really do is you, you write down some sort of extended uh, beta ansatz, and then you do some uh, elliptic uh, trickery looking at poles and blah, blah, blah. And you really show that if you have a solution to the elliptic Algero Sutherland model, then by specializing it to certain parameters, you get a solution, a, a wave function for the beta, for, for Inozemtsev up to solving beta ansatz equations. So this is an exact computation approximations there. And this we, we can do for general, I mean, Inozems have already did this for general number of downspins. So this is very nice. So in principle, this part is sort of in principle known, um, but the details are much more complicated. The beta ansatz equations here are much more complicated. And they depend strongly on which solution of the elliptic Algero Sutherland model you took, which itself already has beta ansatz like equations. All right, so this is the kind of the summary of this, uh, of this is what I wanted to talk uh, so tell you about this isotropic level. How much time do I have left? About 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right. So let me tell you briefly about both the partially isotropic level and actually another long range deformation of Heisenberg type models. Um, so we're going to change gears and if you can decouple, then this is a good point to re-enter. So the following will be independent of the previous. So now let's consider the inhomogeneous Heisenberg XXZ spin chain. So, you know, this is something, so the Heisenberg spin chain, if we compute it, then we start with an R matrix. Here I take the six vertex R matrix. I, to be precise, I take the, uh, the homogeneous gradation so I can write it in terms of temporary leap, but the details are not so important. It obeys Young-Baxter, unitarity, and some sort of initial condition. And then you form the monodromy matrix and you take its trace to get the transfer matrix T. Now, because of the Young-Baxter equation, we all know that these transfer matrices commute at different values of this spectral parameter U. And here the Zs are my inhomogeneities. I work multiplicatively. Um, so because of the Young-Baxter equation, we have a one parameter family of commuting transfer matrices. That's what this says here. Now, what, since we have commuting transfer matrices, we can get true spin chain operators by our favorite expansion of the transfer matrix. And a good point to do this expansion is where we can use this initial condition to simplify at least one of these crossings in the transfer matrix. So what you want to do is you want to choose your U to be equal to one of the values at the bottom here. So let's look at the, what would be the translation operator normally. And uh, now choose any Z, any of our inhomogeneities to uh, take as a spectral parameter. And then pictorially, what happens is, well, you had this thing here, but now I take Z, U to be ZJ. So over here, I get this situation. So this crossing opens up and it gives me this picture here. So from this picture, you can read off immediately an expression in terms of R matrices. I want to use mostly pictorial uh, stuff here, but you can really write down formulas and you know check stuff. Um, maybe it's good to say that if I would take my inhomogeneities to all be equal, or let's say equal to one for simplicity, then what happens is, um, well, I again use this thing. So we, all these crossings kind of open up. And instead you see that if all these crossings open up, I just get the operator which shifts by one to the right periodically. So this is just the usual shift operator. But here we have L different shift operator, kind of not really shift operators, but L, L different things which all deform the shift operator. So sometimes these are called scattering operators. Sometimes I think they're also called young bucks. Um, they all commute and they don't have the property that the Lth power is one, but instead if you multiply all of them, then this is the picture. Now by unitarity, you can kind of open up all these crossings here and basically all, none of the lines cross. So you just get the identity here. So instead these operators, all their products are one 
Now, if you take the homogeneous limit, then all of them become the same. So you get the usual relation that the elf power of the, in that case, translation operator is one. And that's why we get the notion of a quantized momentum in that case. Um, all right, so let's be a bit more brave and go to the next order in the, 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 comp the computation. So what we want to do is we want to take the logarithmic, logarithmic derivative of the transfer matrix at this special value of our inhomogeneity. So let me compute it as the, the derivative with respect to the first argument at zj times the inverse of this scattering operator. So pictorially, the inverse of this thing is just if I flip left and right. So this is this picture here at the bottom. And now this derivative here, well, we have a product of things that all depend on you. So we get a sum of all the derivatives. Let me denote this derivative by a dot. Okay, so then the derivative can either be to the left of the value or at the value uh, of the inhomogeneity that we plugged in or to the right of it. So these are the pictures that we get for the Hamiltonian. So it's either, right? So, so these are the three possibilities basically. So we can continue our computation. So note that here, for instance, we have precisely an instance of this unitarity. So I can certainly unwind this stuff until I get just a crossing that would look like, you know, there's a line here and then here and then there's a dot here. So it is a composition of the R matrix and the derivative of an R matrix. Now we can compute a bit more about this. It turns out that this R matrix times the derivative of the R matrix is just the derivative of the R matrix time at, at one times a function, which here I call V, it's like a potential. So it is basically uh, the product of the two inhomogeneities. And then here's like a little Q van der Monde times a Q inverse van der Monde, if you wish. Um, so what you get is the following, up to some constants, you get this potential normalized times some sort of strange long range interaction where the jth spin, remember this was the jth Hamiltonian, so the jth spin moves to the left until it's at I plus one, then it interacts via the usual uh, local Hamiltonian, and then it transports back. But here the transport is always via these, arch, these R matrices. Then there is another term, so I'll come back to this in a moment. Then there's another term. If J was to the right of K, then what's going to happen is that J is going to go periodically all the way to K plus one, it interacts and it moves back. So basically this is just like this, except that you use periodicity. So J always wants to go to the left to interact with this other thing. And now the strange case is this one here where J interacts with itself. And actually that's what it does if you do this carefully. So what happens is that J goes to the left, then it interacts with itself in the future. It goes to the right to interact with itself from the past and then it finishes. So this looks a little bit weird, but what you can, this you can again write in equations. What you do is you write this temporary leap generator or in more generally your derivative of the R matrix as you know, a, a, product, a tensor product of two, you take a basis of operators on one side, you write a tensor product of these two uh, bases on one side with some coefficients. And that's how you can kind of split the, the, the interaction into two things. So I, I can write down the details later if somebody's interested, maybe. I'm. Uh, sure, you could. I haven't, but uh, you can, yeah. Um, right, so let me take the homogeneous limit here as well, just to check that everything is correct. So remember, in the homogeneous th limit, all these crossings just open up. So what happens here is that in the inhomogeneous limit, all these crossings open up. So basically, nothing happens except that here I interacts with I plus one for all i lower than j. Here, j interacts with actually j plus one, no longer with itself. And then here, k interacts with k plus one for all the k larger than z. So you see if you, and then these coefficients all become one, of course, if you took all the z's to be one. So this is just the usual x, x, z nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. So this is a consistency check. Okay, so I just wanted to show that actually normally we think spin chain as you know, computational tool. It's natural from the six vertex point of view. It's kind of nice from uh, geometric representation theory, if you wish. It's the, these inhomogeneities are equivariant parameters. Uh, if you like supersymmetric gauge theories, beta gauge correspondence naturally has inhomogeneities. I forget uh, affected masses or whatever they're called. Um, but so there are actually some various reasons to introduce them. Also in proofs of completeness is good because you lift some degeneracies for generic inhomogeneities. But what I want to propose is actually this is kind of a nice model by itself for finite size. Of course, if you're going to send the length to infinity, then you have to think very carefully. You kind of probably don't want to manage infinitely many different indeterminates unless you would want to do something like McDonald's where you, you know, but I don't know if that's possible. So usually that's where you take, for instance, the, the homogeneous limit. But for finite size, this inhomogeneous XXZ spin chain, there are lots of these Hamiltonians and they look quite nice. And of course, um, so here is the Hamiltonian again. We can find its exact spectrum using the algebraic 
that's um, up to solving beta ansatz equations, where then you know the e to the i p uh, like momentum times the length is deformed into a product where all the inhomogeneities enter. So this is the recap of what I just showed you. Um, now this model is quite complicated. It has this complicated self interaction. There's some sort of periodicity and so on happening. The QT formed Hall and Shastri spin chain actually turns out to look very similar to this inhomogeneous Heisenberg spin chain, except that the only interactions that happen are these kind of fairly simple ones. Namely, the Q deformed Hall and Shastri spin chain is a sum over pairs of sites where there is the same potential function that we had here without the normalization. So the same, this function here times just the interaction where J moves to the left to interact with I and then it moves back via our matrices. The difference is that to really get the Q difference on the just free spin chain, we have to not take the homogeneous limit, but instead we have to evaluate these ZJs to Jth powers of the else primitive root of unity or the primitive else root of unity. Okay, so this is a special other point. Notice that this is also a periodic point. Here it is still true that if you take ratios of these uh, things, they only depend on the difference of the coordinates. So it's kind of nice from that point of view and it's consistent with periodicity. If we take Q to one, then this, this function here just becomes Z, Z prime, minus Z, Z prime over the difference squared. And if you write it in terms of these things here, you just get this one over sine squared that we had for Haldane Shastri. If you take I, uh, Q to one here, then actually what happens is that this just becomes one minus the long distance permutation. So this is a true uh, long range model, uh, of course. And so here's the Q deformed Hall and Shastri model. So it looks like a bit of a monster, but actually once you've gone through inhomogeneous XXZ, it's actually a little bit simpler than inhomogeneous XXZ. And accordingly, actually its spectrum can exactly be found via a connection to a Q deformation of these Calogero Sutherland models, which are known as Reusenaar's McDonald models. So, and we have this exact spectrum in closed form. So here is the picture. I don't really want to go in details because of time, but basically if instead of the degenerate affine Hecke algebra, you start with the affine Hecke algebra, then you either get a scalar model or you can introduce spins, then you can freeze, then you get this spin chain precisely with the Hamiltonian that I showed you before. So that's how really how we compute it. And again, it's down spins behave precisely like a fewer particle special value of the couplings version of this scalar model, which has exact eigenfunctions that are McDonald's polynomials. So for Q deformed Halde Shastri, we also have a closed form um, description of the highest weight eigenvectors. In this case, it's quantum loop highest weight eigenvectors. And they've, so there's sort of like a Q deformed van der Monde squared, if you wish, the symmetric square of the Q van der Monde times a special point of the McDonald's polynomials that are known as quantum zonal spherical functions. Now let me, for the more minded people, mention that actually this kind of highlights, this is really, we can reinterpret this in terms of affine pure probability. And I want to advocate this as the point of view for these long range spin chains. So here there's a map that sends a module for the affine Hecke algebra to a module for the quantum loop algebra. And if you're careful, then the center of the affine Hecke algebra acts by symmetries, and that's where the Hamiltonian comes from. So this is what's known as the, well, it's kind of like the Q deformation of the Drinfeld functor. It was studied by Charlie and Presley, but actually earlier by Bernard Godin, Haldane, and Pasquier. And um, so this is the spin version of the McDonald's uh, model. We can understand this very nicely. We have exact high, uh, eigenfunctions here via partial symmetrizations of non-symmetric McDonald's polynomials. But so this map is really the sure while functor, if you wish, the sure function, the quantum affine version of the sure functor. And this is a very special case of it in which I took the vector space to be one dimensional. So there are no spins. But in fact, I can do this for any GLK module. And there's a very nice story here. And this is why I'm come back to uh, Philippe's question. So if instead here, rather than working with the representation of polynomials with Y operators, if you take the simpler representation where you just act by multiplication, which is also an affine Hecke algebra module, then here the quantum loop action would be given by the usual inhomogeneous XXZ spin uh, L operator. In that case, the center is trivial. It's just uh, multiple of the identity. So instead what you could do is you can take the, the trace and look, then you would get to these inhomogeneous XXZ models. So rather, the double affine Hecke algebra really plays a role here where we get either this trigonometric spin Reusenaar's McDonald or inhomogeneous XXZ, depending on which of the two we do. And if we here really take Daha, then here we should get somehow an interplay of both, which is what I mentioned before. There should be some role for a quantum toroidal al algebra here. Um, right, 
So that was a little bit of representation theory. Let me just mention Q deformed in if is not known. I would love to know it because that would be a deformation which really goes in between somehow these two Shurwal dual, uh, I mean, Cherepnik dual uh, models. So we have, you know, maybe Heisenberg XXZ if I take homogeneous, or maybe it should be some inhomogeneous Heisenberg XXZ. And on the other side, this Q deformed Hall and Shastri model. So I would really like to know what happens in between. Uh, I think it would be very interesting, maybe not so much from a physics point of view, but I think it would really teach us a lot about what the structure of, in, what it means to be in, integrable. If we would find this, you know, like a version of an L operator here, that would be amazing. It would somehow allow you to interpolate between the two uh, Cheretnik kind of Daha dual models here and here. And right, so here's the big picture. So just to wrap up, what I showed you is how to go from Heisenberg via Inozemtsev to Haldane Shastri. I also showed you how to Q-deform this by going from degenerate affine to affine Hecke algebras. And then I showed you that the Heisenberg XXZ is actually also sitting in another family of long range models via inhomogeneities. And what I really think is that by this long range picture, what, do I, what, what I want to do is conquer the world of long range spin chains. And I think that this will show us, even teach us a lot about these nearest neighbor Heisenberg spin chains. And underlying all of this should be an analogous map for quantum many body systems with or without spins via freezing and so on. So I think a lot of uh, things are uh, to be happening here. I'm also working on at least some elliptic things, but of course they're much harder. Um, so I'd lo at least I hope to have shown you an quite exciting uh, landscape and uh, free of tension. Just a tiny question. You, you had a, among the final slides, you had a conjecture, which is the only thing which is not unknown. <laughs> right, yeah. So this means that you have a conjecture for the potential such that if you diagonalize the states, you see that there is no level, level cross, there is level crossing, there is no level split. No, it's much weaker. Um, so what you can do is you can get, um, you can get an elliptic, oh, sorry. Um, you can get an elliptic function by uh, forcing, like putting an imaginary period in here. So you just take an infinite sum with, to kind of force this function to be imaginary periodic, and then you get some sort of uh, zeta minus zeta, which if Q goes to one becomes Weierstrass P as a derivative of zeta. Um, but what we don't know yet is the precise long range spin interaction. So remember here, this is much more subtle because I also need to know what happens here. And so I know what I, so the conjecture is very weak. We just have a proposal for what we think would be the potential here. At least it will limit to the right potentials there and there, but it does not. So it, what you could do, of course, is just take this Hamiltonian and put our conjecture for the potential in here. But you see that these long range interactions, they're actually multi-particle interacting. They're incredibly complicated. For Haldane Shastri, for Q-deformed Haldane Shastri, we were lucky. We had all this representation theory with it, which allowed us not to compute any actions of the Hamiltonian, but just be very clever and understand its spectrum. Um, so in fact, if I take the one particle uh, eigenvectors of Q-deformed Haldane Shastri, this is not uh, translational linear variant in the standard way, so you don't get magnons, they're more complicated. Um, I can find them using some sort of representation theory type of trick, it's not hard, but I am not able to compute actually the action of the Hamiltonian on these eigenvectors directly. This is extremely hard. So even for the one particle vectors here, it is kind of, it seems, well, maybe if we're very, very courageous, we would be able to find a potential corresponding to such a Hamiltonian with our conjecture for the potential. But it is, so, Trying to do coordinate based on that seems very, very hopeless. Um, do I understand correctly that you start with the isotropic six vertex model, then you could Q deform it, then you construct inhomogeneous transfer matrices from which you get the Q deformed uh, Holden Shastri model. And uh, then Q to one would give you the isotropic, um, the usual Holden Shastri model. Is that correct? No, well, okay. So six vertex is already Q deformed, right? So, so what I, not quite. So what I wanted to do, so actually this, this Hamiltonian really to get it, I use this, this picture, which I think I showed on the next page. So I use this kind of quite abstract representation theory type of thing to uh, take this representation of this algebra here. Then I get these McDonald's operators and then I do this thing called freezing and and this is how I really compute these Hamiltonians. Um, here, 
you know, these Hamiltonians, if you've never seen anything like it, they look quite intimidating. What I wanted to do is I wanted to show you that they may be a bit intimidating as I kind of answered to uh, Andrea's question, but in fact, there is a Hamiltonian which kind of implicitly we all know, just the inhomogeneous version of the XXZ, which is much more complicated than this QD from Tal and Shastri. But the L operators would be quite different. So no, there's not a simple, from this L operator here, I cannot get this Hamiltonian. Okay, thanks. Um, Jules, the um, commuting transfer matrices generate an abelian subalgebra, whatever your underlying algebra is. How does that compare to the SETI um, abelian subalgebra generated by the Y operators in, uh, in right. a fine hacker? So, what we do in um, so over here we have some quantum loop or in in the in the in the Q going to one limit Youngian symmetry. There is indeed, uh, there are two abelian subalgebras. One is um, the quantum, the generated by the quantum determinant. It's actually the center of the uh, this quantum loop algebra. And that is where these commuting Hamiltonians of the spin McDonald model come from. Okay, so this is the center and that's why the whole algebra X by symmetry. So there will not be an algebraic beta on that since that we need something like this connection, uh, like I outlined here. Um, now, what you could, of course, do, and this is something that we're doing with Didina and uh, Gwenael Ferrando and Fedor Levkovich Masuljuk, is you can also look at this L operator here. It looks like an inhomogeneous L operator, but with Y operators instead of inhomogeneities, but formally they commute so we can do all the computations like before. And what you can do is instead take it straight. Then you get a abelian subalgebra um, that is like the beta algebra of this action of the quantum loop algebra here. And what we are working on is indeed what you can do is you can also understand its spectrum. So this is quite nice. If you introduce a twist, for instance, and you send the twist to infinity, this will give the von zeppelin basis for this quantum loop symmetry here. So there's a very nice story that you can do by kind of changing which abelian subalgebra I take here, whether I take the, just the center or this beta algebra. And one thing that we don't know yet, but it should be possible is if we take this transfer matrix here, we can also freeze and we should be able to get some extra Hamiltonians of this thing here. Remember, this is a very big symmetry algebra. So in fact, what I'm saying is that there are other Hamiltonians that commute with all of these here and with each other, but they don't commute with the quantum loop action. Those would be um, some sort of extra Hamiltonians, which would be diagonalized by uh, algebraic beta ansatz with you know, Y operators instead of inhomogeneities. And formally you can play the same game. And what we would like to do is get explicit expressions here. In fact, I think that some of them will be limits of these charges uh, proposed by Dietrich and Zemtsev if you would go to the isotropic uh, haldane shastri model. So, right, so there are two million subalgebras. Thank you for your nice talk. Okay. <laughs>